Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org. The current theme is, theme is on phylogenetic models for continuous traits and their applications. In this series of three talks, we're hearing from three perspectives on continuous traits. First, we heard from Josh Schreiber on applications of phylogenetic continuous trait models to gene expression. Today, we'll hear from Joseph Ureta on the need for phylogenetic natural history. And then in March, Michael Landis will describe his work on pulse models for trait evolution. If you want to ask a question, either tweet at Phalloseminar or type your question in the live chat box at the right of the video on YouTube. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Joseph Hueda. Joseph got his PhD from Oregon State in Corvallis with Seven Arnold, then did a postdoc with Luke Harmon at the University of Idaho in Moscow. Recently joined the Faculty of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. Welcome, Joseph, and thanks for participating. Thank you, Eric. Um, so every, everybody can hear me, hopefully. Um, so today, um, I want to talk about uh, a paper that we've uh, that I've been working on. That's really kind of a culmination of uh, thinking about what's going on in comparative methods um, for uh, the last few years. Mostly me being really confused and trying to make sense of it all. Um, but before I want to uh, get into talking about uh, phylogenetic comparative methods, um, I want to talk about horned lizards. Uh, Horn lizards are pretty cool. Um, so you can see from this picture that this lizard is very cryptic. Uh, it looks like the sand. It's got horns. So that's why they're named that way. Uh, and it's not quite like other lizards that you might find. Uh, for one thing, they're pretty fat. Um, they're a lot easier to catch, I find, than other lizards because uh, they're uh, kind of slow. They hide um, and they don't, you know, run really fast. So there's a lot of things that make these these uh, critters a, a little bit different. Um, a lot of them uh, tend to be like ant specialists, so they'll uh, live this kind of lazy day where they sit uh, on a line of ants and just lick them up as they go by, um, and then they bury themselves in the sand around the ant hill uh, later uh, in the day when they're done eating. They also have pretty spectacular behaviors in some species, like squirting blood from their eyes uh, at uh, would-be predators. So this. Uh, um, uh, a horn lizard is, you know, squirting a, uh, a blood in the eye of this coyote, so it's less likely to eat it, presumably, which is pretty cool. Um, not the only person to think so. Um, so the main point of, you know, my talk here is is that horn lizards are really cool in a lot of different ways. Uh, this the TCU horn frogs are named after them, uh, and if you go to the Sporting Book Nation's fan site, uh, Frog of War, they they uh, uh, kind of commemorate the. Uh, uh, ice blood squirting uh, behavior and and horned lizards and and so you know uh, uh, horned lizards are cool I think uh, a lot of us can agree on that but as evolutionary biologists that's maybe not enough we might be interested in what causes uh, adaptations in lizards uh, more generally and so you know uh, we might be interested in what causes you know color evolution in horned lizards or uh, body size evolution or shape evolution, and we might have some hypotheses for the types of things that influence these sorts of characters. And so uh, we might want to expand our study outside of horned lizards, and we might want to go catch a bunch of other lizards and measure stuff about them, which they probably won't enjoy very much, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, we can um, uh, under, uh, take these, this trait data uh, and uh, formulate a test of our hypothesis. And so if you imagine you have two traits of interest, X and Y, that you've measured in these lizards, and then you want to then relate them to one another. Um, uh, so normally, if we just collected independent data, we would uh, put the data out there, and then we would perform a linear regression through the data uh, and say, oh, is there a relationship or is there not a relationship? Uh, between these two things. But as Joe Felsenstein um, demonstrated in his 1985 paper, there's a problem with that. What if the data that's on the right here is really uh, driven by this uh, uh, underlying phylogeny, where there's basically just two clades, and then those two clades form two clusters, and so that positive uh, visual appearance of a positive uh, relationship between X and Y is really just the difference between these two clades. So you can think of these as being, you know, say mammals and birds or two groups of lizards or whatever. Um, and so this really drove home and I think was really obvious to anybody who read Felsenstein's paper that what we need to consider is um, the phylogeny when, when dealing with these sorts of data. 
um, and that we need to use phylogenetic comparative methods. And I think the, the message that uh, as a community we took from that paper was that phylogenies help us to identify these independent evolutionary events and as independent events that our statistical tests rely on. And as long as we uh, do that, then we're essentially uh, safe. If we consider phylogeny, we can account for the non-independence of the data uh, and that is introduced by phylogeny, uh, and we can do our tests and come to reasonable conclusions. So there's kind of you know two uh, things you have to keep in mind. We tell people it's like oh you have phylogeny introduces statistical non-independence, and correlation does not equal causation. But we're uh, to back up, we're kind of in an interesting time in comparative methods where um, there's been this explosion of approaches. And at the same time, there's been a critical reevaluation of some of these approaches, which I think is very healthy. Um, but it's, 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 it's come time for us to really think about what our methods are doing. And, and I think a lot of people that I talk to who are outside of comparative methods, empirical biologists who want to uh, uh, study uh, trade evolution on, in their data set, they get frustrated with all these papers that are coming out. Um, and, and I think that uh, there is potentially this dark side uh, to comparative methods that, that uh, uh, Natalie Cooper and her co-authors talked about. Um, and I want to highlight two particular papers that really illustrated kind of outstanding problems, I think, in the field of comparative methods. Uh, the first was by uh, Wayne Madison and Rich Fitzjohn, where they looked at common comparative tests for correlation between discrete characters. And so they illustrated four scenarios here. And just looking at these as uh, biologists or as statisticians, it seems like scenario A has really good evidence for a correlation between traits. Whenever the trait X uh, evolves on the phylogeny, the trait Y also evolves on the phylogeny. Um, and, and that has a really tight relationship. There's multiple independent events. It really looks like those two traits are correlated. Scenario B is pretty much the same thing. It's the event of trait X evolving and then the rate of evolving trait Y uh, occurring at the same time go increases. So it's an event with the uh, event of a rate shift essentially. But if we look at scenarios C and D, these are pretty unsatisfying uh, uh, in terms of uh, what we would want to be a significant correlation in our correlation test because they're just one event. Um, you just have, you know, the chance evolution of something, say, like milk in mammals and middle ear bones in mammals, and they happen to occur on the same branch, but do we really think that they're actually in any sort of causal network? Are they related to any, each other in any meaningful way biologically, or is it just that they happen to appear at the same time? We can do the same thing in scenario D. Again, it's just the chance occurrence of an event with the chance occurrence of an event, which is a rate shift. And so we would hope that if our comparative methods are good at identifying these independent evolutionary events, that you know scenarios A and B would be significant and scenarios C and D would not. And what Madison and Fitzjohn found is that every single one of these has a significant uh, correlation using common uh, tests. And I really liked uh, a particular figure in their paper where they talked about how this is an indication that maybe we're not thinking about what comparative methods do correctly. Uh, the same way that relativity bends uh, 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 space-time and makes our perceptions and our intuitions that are based on what we can observe in the uh, uh, um, uh, world, then uh, uh, that the biodiversity time it has a similar effect where uh, we have trouble seeing through the evolutionary patterns that exist in three-dimensional uh, or in four-dimensional space going back in time. And that really is making it so that we're not really understanding um, how uh, phylogenies are influencing uh, um, uh, uh, our comparative methods and what we're actually doing when we apply these comparative methods. So they made the argument that um, this was a major problem for discrete character correlations, but that for continuous traits, uh, there was enough information that it wasn't as big a problem um, and that uh, we didn't have to worry about it as much there. Um, but I'm going to make the argument that these sorts of rare singular events basically break every single comparative method that we have. And so uh, 
it, it's a far wider problem than, um, than just discrete character correlations. So regardless if, if you're trying to relate uh, two continuous traits with a method like independent contrast, and then I've mapped on here uh, uh, the traits and also the singular events that happen to occur at the same point in time, um, you have an independent contrast analysis. If you're trying to relate a continuous trait to a discrete trait using a model like an ornstein uhlenbeck model, uh, Madison Fitchjohn looked at the discrete trait and the discrete trait using Pagel's correlation test. That obviously has a problem. And then other methods like BISI, where you have a uh, diversification uh, uh, rate that's related to a trait. All of these scenarios suffer from this problem that they will find a significant relationship between the X and Y uh, given a single trait. And so I'm going to uh, uh, use the talk to, to, to sh demonstrate that. Um, but before I do that, I want to get to the second paper that I think uh, kind of um, uh, really um, uh, put the warning sign on uh, some of the things that we're doing in comparative methods. And that was uh, an examination of the performance of state-dependent diversification models by uh, Rabosky and Goldberg. And of, of course, the BISI models were tested extensively. They uh, perform very well on simulated data. They're very elegant models and, and very well implemented. But uh, Roboski and Goldberg showed that 77% of 400 data sets showed a significant association between speciation rate and taxonomic name length when they applied it to real data sets, real phylogenies. And so what's going on there? Do we, is the name of a species, what we name a species influencing diversification? Probably not. Instead, what Bolu and Amira pointed out is that the real problem here is that we are comparing two models, and both of these are wrong. And so you can compare a constant rate of diversification against a trait-dependent diversification model like BISI. But there's a third possibility, that there's variable diversification that's independent of the hypothesis that the trait is, is uh, affecting diversification. And so it wasn't that the models were, uh, the model tests were wrong. Uh, the trait-dependent diversification models really are better for explaining uh, real-world phylogenies because there's often real uh, variability in diversification rates. Uh, but when you compare it against this uh, bad null hypothesis of a constant rate of diversification, it's going to do better because it accounts for that a little bit of heterogeneity at least. But the third possibility, which uh, Bolu and Amira have uh, implemented in their HISI model, allows for variable uh, 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 diversification rates at the same time uh, as that's potentially independent of the trait evolution. And so the insight here, I think, is a general one that can um, apply to a lot of the things we do in comparative methods, that we have to account for these uh, uh, background events that are going to be common in the evolution uh, uh, when you're thinking of millions of years of evolution in a clade. So uh, rare singular events break everything, and we need to account for these background events. And so um, going from there, uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of go through three case studies um, where we look at uh, how rare singular events break everything and maybe some solutions to that problem or understanding why that is. And then I'm going to make the argument that uh, this points to a broader problem in comparative methods that we uh, are not thinking uh, through that biodiversity space time in the right way, and that we need to think about how the, the, the causal mechanisms, the, the processes that underlie evolution are really leading to the um, patterns that we see across the tree of life. So to start, uh, I'm going to go back to Feldenstein's 1985 paper, his contrast paper, and uh, look at the worst case scenario, as he called it, um, where we are we're trying to relate two traits to one another, trait X and trait Y, using contrasts. And so, um, first of all, uh, um, uh, when we look at this, this scenario, I think the community often took that, oh, the problem is that there's, these data are non-independent because of phylogeny. But why can't we do a regular linear regression through this data? Is it because non-independence of data points or non-independence of species is an assumption of linear regression? Well, as Liam Revel has, sh has shown and other authors have shown, and I, I have no doubt that, uh, that Joe Felsenstein uh, knows, uh, that is not an assumption of linear regression. 
it's an assumption. Uh, if we actually look at what the assumptions of linear regression are, it's uh, uh, if we wanted to relate trait X and trait Y, if all the phylogenetic signal is in uh, trait X, and so and we actually observe trait X, then we don't need to use phylogenetic comparative methods at all. Um, the real assumption of a linear regression that's violated is the non-independence of residual error variation. Okay, and so if you if all the phylogenetic signal is in X and then X causes Y, you don't actually need uh, to use a phylogenetic regression. You can use an ordinary least squares regression, and you'll get a better estimate of that effect of X on Y because we actually observe X, so we don't need to model the unknown evolutionary history. So why do we use independent contrast? And so Independent contrast has been shown to be um, uh, equivalent to phylogenetic generalized least squares when uh, there's a Brownian motion of the residuals. And so a PGLS model would have this sort of structure where X has an effect on Y in, in each case, but there's other factors that follow the phylogeny that are unaccounted for by X. Um, this is, and this seems like a pretty reasonable uh, assumption that and this evolves on the phylogeny and also has an effect on these Ys. So that more closely related species tend to have more similar residuals uh, than you would predict um, uh, give, uh, under an in, where they were independent of each other. And so if you don't observe these uh, 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 residu or these uh, other factors, then you have to specify some sort of model to account for them. And the model that uh, is in uh, Joe's paper is Brownian motion, um, which is a has some nice properties, and uh, it seems uh, somewhat reasonable for uh, evolution on a tree. And so we can model those unseen residual effects using Brownian motion um, and account for them in our analyses. And if you do that and apply it to Felsenstein's worst case scenario, where the um, you evolve by Brownian motion up the tree and the two traits are uncorrelated and you get a pattern like this, this will end up being a uh, non-significant result, which is satisfying because the difference between the two clades is just driven by the uh, random evolutionary change that happened to accumulate on those two branches. But what if we change this model a little bit? What if we uh, keep the feature that the two traits are completely uncorrelated, they're evolving down the phylogeny, but we introduce a singular event that happens in both of those um, uh, lineages uh, at the exact same time in the tree. So for the ancestor of X5 and X6, we just have this uh, sudden evolutionary event in both traits X and Y, so a single event where again, the traits are uncorrelated, but we just draw them from a different distribution than this Brownian motion process. Well, if you do that, it's very easy to get a pattern that looks like this. And I would argue that if this had been the paper, the figure in Joe's paper, I would have uh, thought the same thing about it. I'd say, oh, well, you're just comparing two groups. Uh, there's not really, it's just one thing, it's one event. Uh, there's not really good evidence for uh, a relationship there. Um, this shouldn't be uh, significant either if we use our comparative methods. But if we apply independent contrast, we actually see that um, what happens is that that one contrast between the two clades becomes a very high leverage statistical outlier. And as the size of the shift gets bigger relative to the Brownian motion variance, you get a uh, uh, increasing number of simulations where that becomes significant. And it doesn't really matter if you use um, independent identically distributed residuals and have uh, polytomies, or if you have a fully bifurcating tree that has phylogenetically correlated residuals. It doesn't matter, the pattern's the same. Everything just gets driven by that one contrast. And so, uh, I think that the independence of the residuals doesn't really capture the problem. It's more along the lines of what Bolu and Amira uh, showed, which is that the model is wrong. And that's, I think, the simple um, uh, argument to this, what I've shown here, is, and that um, certainly uh, 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 Felsenstein appreciated in his paper and, and said that um, the underlying model is an obvious uh, place for future development. It's also true that when you're doing a contrast analysis, you can do something like 
um, plot your residuals and look at uh, your contrast and see if there's this outlier that's maybe violating um, Brownian motion. But it becomes difficult to know exactly what to do with the uh, data of what to do with that outlier. Is that outlier actually an indication that X and Y are related? Or is it just that they happen to, have to, to occur by chance? Essentially, this becomes the, exactly the same as the Madison and Fitzjohn, Fitzjohn problem. Is our X and Y uh, related? And is this chance occurrence of this event on the same branch uh, in both traits good evidence for that? And there's also the question of whether this sort of model is biologically realistic. Uh, so uh, years back, I published a paper where we looked at um, patterns of evolution across uh, the tree of life, and we found evidence for a burst-like evolution uh, on million-year timescales. In particular, the waiting time between events we estimated to be about 25 million years. Um, these the burst-like evolution. So if you're looking at a clade, it, it seems likely that there's going to be a, maybe a handful of these sorts of uh, large adaptive shifts. Um, a much better paper has recently come out by the two uh, authors uh, that, um, two speakers that are on either side of me in this uh, phyla seminar series, which is fun, uh, where they applied a much uh, more statistically correct model. <laughs> we did a quick and dirty analysis. And they got these highly different waiting time of also exactly 25 million years for vertebrates. And there's some, I, to some extent, I think this is kind of maybe just a coincidence. But at the very least, it, it suggests that there is fairly convincing evidence that um, these sorts of singular events or burst-like evolutionary events may be fairly common uh, across the tree of life. And so uh, in, in conclusion of the kind of the section, I would say that realistic modes of trade evolution can break uh, independent contrasts and that rare phylogenetic events will often overwhelm tested eff effects. And if we don't pay attention to that, we can be seriously misled or potentially misled uh, um, about what our data is really showing us. And so um, moving on from that, um, we can now kind of think about, OK, what, what can we potentially do about this? So this is a problem that has existed uh, in real data uh, from the very beginning in, 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 in most of our comparative methods. So now let's look at models of adaptation, which is something that I've worked on uh, extensively, um, where you try to relate, uh, in this case, a continuous trait to a discrete trait. Um, and we're going to talk about ornstein uhlenbeck models. There's, there's alternatives, of course. but um, focus on OU models. And kind of what we do with an orstein uhlenbeck model is that we have a tree and we have a continuous trait, say body size in these bats. And we can, uh, based on um, hypothesized predictors, we can uh, paint different regimes on the tree where we think that uh, species are evolving to different natural selection optima. And using an ornstein uhlenbeck model uh, that was really uh, pioneered by Thomas Hansen and then uh, later by Butler and King, we can evolve this process on, down the tree. And it, it's a generalization of a Brownian motion model uh, where you have random evolution, uh, but you also have uh, adaptation towards these macroevolutionary optima uh, uh, that are different for these different regimes. Um, and so what do these, these things represent? Well, you might think that you know you that something like habitat might affect bat body size. So depending on where they live, uh, they evolve to different macroevolutionary optima. And you might have different hypothesized predictors. You might have different categorizations of those uh, hypothesized predictors. So uh, what people often do is they formulate a set of hypotheses that they think can explain. Um, uh, uh, body size evolution in bats. And then they uh, have these different hypotheses. So maybe everything has the same regime, or the, the desert and the temperate forests are the really the same, or you, that the best predictor of bat body size is to split those three up. And then you fit those models, and you compare them by something like AIC. Uh, the lowest AIC is the best model. And then you say that this uh, model best explains evolution of that body size. But 
One of the issues with this is that uh, the best model might still be a bad model. And um, are we really getting uh, the true pattern of, of evolution and, and true location of these shifts when we uh, use our hypothesized predictor? And so what I've been working on over the past few years is a, is a software package called uh, Bayou that essentially searches across all the possible uh, locations of adaptive shifts on the phylogeny and sees where there, there is evidence of a well-supported shift on that phylogeny. And so these are two very different approaches in uh, philosophy. On the one hand, you have hypothesis testing, where you're testing specific biological predictors that you think might be driving body size evolution in the group. The problem with it is that the best model may still be bad. Uh, the alternative is what I'm going to call a natural history approach um, in the sense that it's just kind of looking through biodiversity space time, as, as Fitzjohn called it, and trying to see where the major events, the major shifts uh, are on the, uh, in the history of, of this clay that you're looking at. And it doesn't say anything about uh, what's causing those things. It's just observation. It's fundamentally enabling us to look through this uh, 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 somewhat inaccessible dimension of phylogeny to see where the, the major adaptive shifts have occurred in the history of this clade. And so it's very descriptive. It just says that stuff happens, and it finds those major events. So rather than getting this nice explanation for why body size is shifting across the tree, you're getting the explanation that something happened on the tree. And we don't know what that is. So these are two very different uh, approaches. And there, it's common to have these two different approaches in a whole a bunch of different fields. So for example, uh, this is the same thing as applying, say, like a BISI model, where you're testing whether a predictor can explain diversification, and a BAM model, where you're just simply looking for where the diversification shifts are occurring. And to some extent, there, these two methods can occasionally be seen at odds with one another, as if they're um, uh, uh, competing in some way. But really, I think they're complementary, because what we want to get to is a point where we know uh, what the major uh, underlying uh, causal factors are for trade evolution. At the same time, we don't want to uh, uh, be deceived by just a few chance events that happened on the tree um, really driving those results. And so to illustrate that, uh, I'm going to go back to a paper that, uh, a really nice paper um, by uh, Scales et al, looking at muscle fiber evolution using a hypothesis testing framework, um, uh, ornstein uhlenbeck framework. And I read this paper in, in, when I was a grad student. And um, they, they tested three different hypotheses for what caused uh, muscle fiber evolution in lizards. And they were looking at um, the trait that they were interested in was the proportion of the muscle fiber that was made up of flat, fast glycolytic uh, muscles. Um, so it's kind of like fast twitch, slow twitch muscle fiber composition uh, in response to um, foraging mode or predator escape or a combination of the, of the two. And so they had three hypotheses where they categorized this set of lizards into foraging mode. Uh, so whether they were sit and wait predators or whether they were active, constantly roaming the environment looking for food or whether they had a mixed strategy. And then they had a predator escape hypothesis, uh, same sort of thing where you had cryptic species or uh, species that would just automatically flee. So they're active escape or a mixed strategy. And then every combination of those two. And they tested which of these best explained muscle fiber evolution in these lizards. And it turned out predator escape was uh, uh, the best model. But what, I remember reading this and being a little bit bothered by it, um, uh, specifically because I was worried. And I was worried because of this clade here, the Phrynosoma. And so this predator escape model is the simplest model that gives Phrynosoma uh, their own uh, regime. And if you looked at the data, um, one thing that was kind of Interesting is the Phrynosoma were just weird. They were just kind of outside the rest of the lizards. And uh, Phrynosoma are also known as horned lizards. So these are the same group of lizards that I talked about at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, and these guys uh, are, are just kind of weird little lizards compared to the rest of these species. 
And even more, if you look at uh, how, how the authors characterize foraging mode, they called uh, Phrynosoma sit and wait predators, and they called species like Gamb Gambelia wislazinii a sit and wait predator. So as I said, the Phrynosoma are sit and wait in the sense that they sit on top of a line of ants and they lick them up as they go by. Uh, Gambelia wislazinii is sit and wait in the sense that it sits in a crevice in a rock and as a, another lizard goes by, it, it leaps out, tackles it, and consumes a lizard that's a substantial proportion of its own size. And so are these really energetically or de uh, similar demands on muscle fibers, these two activities? Well, I would say probably not. And I don't want to uh, say this to criticize the choices that the authors made. Rather, I'm going to make the argument that this sort of uh, splitting or lumping is going to be um, just kind of ubiquitous anytime uh, the signal in our data is driven by a single evolutionary event or a single clade that's unique, you can find ways of splitting almost any predictor into a uh, finer or more uh, a different way of measuring it so that, that that clade comes out as being special or different. And that's just going to be a fundamental problem to uh, most of what we do in comparative methods. Uh, and so I, I'm not faulting the authors at all in this, um, but rather just saying that if you have a single event, that can be a very dangerous situation. So is there evidence that something that muscle fiber is really well explained by this predator escape hypothesis, or is it just Phrynosoma are a single thing that are different than all the other lizards and that this model just allows that to happen? So to test this idea, uh, I modified Bayou to uh, essentially combine the two approaches, the hypothesis testing framework with um, uh, the data-driven phylogenetic natural history approach. And so what I did is to take the fixed PE hypothesis and I gave it a certain weight. And then uh, I constrained it so that um, that weight was somewhere between zero and one. So if it's zero, that means that the predator escape hypothesis explains nothing. If it's one, it means that it's a really good explanation. It's better than uh, um, any clade specific explanation. And then the rest of the weight was given to the reversible jump process, which just basically looks for where stuff happens on the phylogeny. And I put a really low prior on the number of shifts here. So it was like uh, expected number of shifts on the tree of 0 0.5. So the reversible jump algorithm is basically only going to add a shift on the tree if it's needed to explain some clay that's not well explained by this predator escape hypothesis. And if we fit that, um, I put a prior on that using a beta distribution that was symmetrical from 0 to 1. And I want you to focus just on the purple here. So these are the posteriors for that weight parameter, so that W parameter. And if we fit it to the empirical scales data, we get an intermediate result. That weight is somewhere bounded away from 0 and bounded away from 1. If we simulate data where just Phrynosoma are special, we recover a posterior that puts a high weight on the being 0, just as we'd expect. If we uh, simulate under the true PE hypothesis, we get a weight that is high, uh, has a mode around 1. Um, and uh, so our result really is intermediate. And if we look at the reversible jump part of that analysis, it puts a shift right there on the Phrynosoma, saying Critter uh, escape explains some of this variation, but there's something additional happening in the Phrynosoma that we need to still uh, explain further. And so if I uh, compare uh, posterior probabilities on the branches for uh, data that's simulated using the predator escape hypothesis, I never get spurious support for a shift on the tree. But when I fit it to the empirical data, there's one only and one and only one branch that um, ends up being um, uh, 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 highly supported as having a shift, and that's the Phrynosoma. Okay. So this intermediate result uh, is really uh, interesting. It gives us a more nuanced picture of what's going on here. We have uh, some weight given to that predator escape hypothesis, and then the rest of the weight uh, given to that um, uh, Phrynosoma only model. Uh, where something happens there. And this really, I think, fits well with our intuition about what's going on here. Predator escape probably is a pretty good explanation for muscle fiber and uh, evolution in lizards. Um, the, 
uh, and that horn lizards are just kind of different lizards and they're weird um, and that we need to do uh, we uh, maybe need to explain that uh, pattern a little bit better but what do we do when we have these singular events? Do we have any hope of understanding what, uh, why that is? And so to, to, to understand this, um, I think we need to go back to Madison and Fitzjohn and really understand uh, what the evidence is when we have uh, these cases where we have two discrete characters or two events that happen to just occur on the same branch. So basically in all three of these cases, I've reduced it to a problem where you just have the coincident coincidence that uh, an event happens in both traits of the, uh, on the same branch. And is that, and should that be good evidence for a relationship between those traits? So going back, going back to what Madison Fitzjohn called Darwin's scenario here, uh, what's going on here? Why does this show up as being significant when we use Pagel's correlation tests? Well, we can think about uh, what uh, the, the situation is in these instances um, from the perspective uh, uh, of replaying the tape of evolution, as Gould would say. And what probably is happening here is that if we were to take these traits like milk and middle ear bones, and we were to uh, take the probability that they are going to evolve across the tree of life, we, we can say that they're probably really unlikely to evolve. Um, but they did, right? Uh, if we uh, uh, replayed the tape evolution, there's probably many universes where even if mammals evolved, those traits didn't evolve at all. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but we can assume that it's fairly unlikely um, that those traits evolved at all. But the thing is, we don't study traits that um, uh, uh, don't have any variation. We don't study non-existent traits. Um, so the fact that they did evolve uh, means that uh, they probably just evolved once, and uh, we're almost guaranteed to find a whole bunch of traits that evolved just once and really had no chance, very little chance of evolving in the first place. And if we make that simple assumption, then we can reduce the dependent and independent models for uh, character correlations into, for Darwin's scenario, into a simple problem. We're basically assured that for these really rare events, we're only going to get one of them, and we're only going to study them if there's one of them. And so then it becomes just a question of where did those events occur? We can place that one event on branch I here, uh, and if their two traits are correlated to one another, then the second trait will evolve immediately. Okay, so that uh, trait Y evolved, then trait X evolves right after because they're linked to each other. Or maybe trait X evolves first and then trait Y follows. The alternative is that the two traits are totally unrelated to one another, and then we just have to place them, uh, they just happen to occur on the same branch, and so now we have to place them twice on the tree. Well, what's the probability of selecting this branch once or selecting this branch twice? Well, it's just the length of the branch divided by the total length of the tree. In the dependent case, we only need to do it once because they're correlated, so they'll happen together. Or we have to do it twice. So what this means is that if you're comparing the maximum likelihood estimates of these two fits, uh, it essentially just becomes, boils down to this problem in Darwin's scenario. What's the probability we choose the branch twice versus what's the probability we choose the branch once? And if you think about taking the difference between these two likelihoods, one way to uh, get a significant difference is simply to increase the total branch length of the tree. If you make this branch length, uh, if you make the tree um, taller, uh, bigger and bigger by adding more and more taxa, you're unlikely to change the, the observation that there's only one shift on the tree. These are really rare events, but you're going to make this difference much more significant. And so we tested this idea using available software where we kind of imposed these set of assumptions that we made and asked, is our predicted difference in likelihood that's just based on choosing a branch once versus choosing a branch twice, uh, really what's driving that significant result using Pagel's correlation test? And we can see that it is so long as the transition rates that we're assuming are uh, relatively low. So again, that assumption that uh, most of the time if we replayed the tape of evolution, these traits would only happen once in the tree or less and then we drop off that line uh, as the rates get uh, more different than that. Um, but we can do a really good job of predicting how much support there is for the uh, 
uh, correlated model over this uh, uh, uncorrelated model, just using this simple assumption. And so we might, might think, um, is this actually good evidence for a correlation between these traits? Well, it turns out that Madison Fitzjohn talked about this in their paper. Um, they talked about uh, that on the surface, this does seem like good support uh, for a relationship. Because if you think about it, okay, I don't care how much of an atheist you may be if some uh, uh, if the pope calls a curse down upon your head, which is a pretty rare event, and you get struck by lightning right afterwards. Those are just two uh, chance rare events. There's only a sample size of one. But I think a lot of us probably would be uh, uh, looking to possible causal explanations that would uh, uh, be outside of our uh, prior worldview uh, that we may have, may or may not have. And so, you know, those chance occurrence of those two events really is pretty good evidence of uh, a causation, causal relationship between them. However, the problem is, is that the data that we often use is really poorly suited for this because systematists are particularly uh, 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 interested in traits that are kind of the defining characteristics of clades. So we're not randomly selecting trait, um, trait patterns. We're selecting, often selecting traits that show a specific pattern, and we're searching among all the possible traits for tra traits that specifically are the defining features of clades. So this ascertainment bias um, is really uh, a problem for uh, that being good evidence for a relationship between those two traits. Um, that would otherwise would be if we selected traits randomly. The good news about this is that um, it gives us hope that we can either correct for that ascertainment bias or that we can understand that uh, the problem that Madison and Fitzjohn identified in Darwin's scenario is really a boundary case. So as soon as you have more than, they talked a lot about um, uh, different numbers of origins and intermediate cases, like what do you do with them? and uh, we can, uh, what we, we find, find by uh, uh, specifically uh, determining what the um, uh, factor is that's driving this significant result is we see that this is a boundary case and that as we get more origins or these intermediate cases, it becomes harder and harder uh, very quickly to have this sort of ascertainment bias be a major factor. Uh, and so that really uh, most of the time we probably are doing a pretty good job of, of estimating um, correlations on these trees. So in conclusion of this section, um, I, uh, we make the argument that all comparative methods uh, break with rare singular events, uh, that we need to allow for these background shifts and phylogenetic natural history models where we account for just all the stuff that happens over millions of years of evolution where some clades just do different things um, for reasons that are outside whatever hypothesis we're uh, specifically testing at the moment. And that Darwin scenario, this, this chance occurrence of two events is really a boundary condition that does provide some evidence for a relationship between traits, but has a problem of ascertainment bias. And if we deal with that ascertainment bias, we can move forward to maybe establishing um, when, and, and when, when this sort of evidence is good evidence and when this sort of evidence is bad evidence. And so what I've talked about mostly so far is simply that we need to think about causation better. Um, uh, or I've talked about uh, that there are these rare singular events, but I think that these are a symptom of a broader problem that, uh, uh, at least uh, for me, that the way I was thinking about uh, comparative methods um, was uh, didn't really account for um, how causal factors are affecting uh, trade evolution. And one thing that I think can really help uh, uh, illustrate this is the use of graphical models. And this isn't something that um, I am particularly uh, good at. It's a new field to me. So, um, uh, but what I, in my struggles to understand it and reading through um, uh, the field of, of using graphical models, and particularly using graphical models in the field of causal inference, how can we draw causal inferences from observational data, um, it's really enlightened uh, uh, for me a lot of the issues that are occurring when we think about phylogenetic comparative methods and what they are really doing. So in the early days of comparative methods, there were people who were resistant to the idea that you just always had to apply uh, a method like independent contrast to a problem. 
So Mark Westerby uh, uh, published a paper with colleagues um, on the, the idea that the um, phylogenetic correction is, isn't needed all the time, that there's going to be some things that are correlated with phylogeny and some things that are correlated with ecology, but that ecology is going to evolve down the phylogeny as well, so that if you correct for phylogeny, you're going to overcorrect uh, for um, uh, some of the effect that you're actually testing for. And so that this extreme case, he, he talked about, um, you're attributing everything to phylogeny and nothing to ecology when really ecology has having a big effect on this trait variation. Um, this exact characterization, um, uh, it, uh, don't necessarily agree with. Uh, the response to it um, by uh, Harvey, Reed, and, and me, they talked about how uh, this, this, the way that Westerby was thinking about it was riddled with errors, uh, and they uh, repeat his sentence about this, and then they just give the, the statement that it's wrong. Um, that most recent comparative methods, such as Cronchast analysis, merely uh, partition the variance so the degrees of, of freedom are biologically meaningful. And I think most of the community just kind of moved on from that and said, oh yeah, they're right, um, that Westerby is completely wrong, uh, that um, that's not the way that comparative methods work. But I think what we need to do is to go back and think about um, uh, causation here and what the field of causal inference is really done for understanding um, uh, uh, these sorts of problems. And I'm going to go to a well-known statistical problem called Simpson's paradox. Uh, and this is going to come straight from the uh, uh, kind of uh, textbook for uh, causal inference by Judea Pearl where he talks about how um, these graphical models can really help resolve and understand what's happening in, in Simpson's paradox. But the, the premise is simple, that you have some data. So this is um, uh, men who recover from uh, a certain condition, whether uh, given that they either take the drug, a, a particular drug, or they don't take a drug. And so they do better when they don't take the drug. Women um, are also in this uh, study, and they uh, take the drug and also do wor uh, worse than if they don't take the drug. But this, uh, if you combine these two data tables, what you get is that the drug category actually recovers better than the non-drug category. And this seems paradoxical. Which of these tables do you use? Do you use the gender-specific tables, or do you use the combined uh, data table? Well, it turns out that you can't actually determine this just uh, from the statistics. And what makes this a paradox is really our understanding of uh, causal effects. And so to take straight from Pearl's book, there's uh, alternatives for why this is occurring. So one possibility is that this is an observational study and that gender influences the probability that you're going to take the, the drug. And so if we see this, that's true. Males are more likely to take the drug than females. Gender also influences recovery. Males are more likely to uh, 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 recover than females. And treatment uh, has uh, effect on recovery as well. And so if this is the case, so what's happening in the combined table is that just more men are taking the drug and men take uh, um, recover better. So that ends up being a, a higher recovery rate for the drug category just because there's more men in that group. And so this has no problem for math. Um, it's a very simple explanation. It, it works. And so, and this tells us that we should use those gender specific tables when we're trying to evaluate the effect of the drug C on the recovery. An alternative, so suppose they weren't gender specific tables, but it was something like blood pressure and that we were measuring blood pressure specific tables. If that was the case, we should use the combined table. The problem is, is that it's not blood pressure, it's gender, and so, uh, or biological sex. And so the treatment is, uh, would have to cause a change in biological sex. And we, as uh, uh, humans, think that that is an unlikely effect, that this drug for this uh, particular condition is going to also have the effect of change of gender. That creates the paradox. And so we can't tell based on uh, statistics, which of these, whether we should use the combined tables or the gender specific tables, but our causal assumptions and our causal models can, as illustrated by these graphical models. The same thing occurs when we think about uh, phylogenetic comparative methods. So this is very similar to Felsenstein's scenario, where we ask 
well, should the regression go through the within clade uh, regression or should it go between them? So in our paper, uh, we have uh, a scenario where, that we propose, which is kind of artificial, but kind of illustrates this well, where we think about how the effect of body size may affect species abundance in a group like birds. So body size maybe decreases species abundance because uh, larger body organisms need, require more resources. And then body size uh, also causes a change in migratory behavior. And migratory behavior then has the opposite effect on species abundance. So bigger birds maybe migrate more, and then if they migrate more, they can support larger uh, species abundances because there are more resources. And then we have, uh, in this case, that body size evolves down the phylogeny by something like Brownian motion. And then I simulate this on a, 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 a Felsenstein scenario tree, and I can get data like this. And so what do we do? Do we do an ordinary least squares regression or do we do a phylogenetic correction? Well, we have an alternative model that can produce this exact same data set that's observationally equivalent. And all we've done is to reverse the sign, uh, direction of causality here where the phylogen there's phylogenetic effects in migratory behavior, say a threshold model, and that that migratory behavior then affects body size. So maybe species that are migratory get bigger, then they decrease uh, abundance, but migratory behavior increases uh, a, or increases species abundance. So using the same figures that we use here, we should use the uh, ordinary least squares for this analysis, and we should use phylogenetic least squares for this analysis. And just understand that, think about what would happen if you artificially selected on body sizes in these cases. If you increase body size, in this case, you would then have the effect of increasing the probability that the species that you're selecting on becomes migratory. So you need to account for both of those, uh, those arrows when you're evaluating the relationship of body size on species abundance. But if you uh, are in this scenario, then when you select on body size, uh, you won't have any effect on migratory behavior. Instead, migratory behavior has this phylogenetic uh, component uh, that's unaccounted for and it fits really well with our PGLS model. Uh, and so we can uh, uh, use PGLS to account for that unobserved phylogenetic effects that have an effect on the trait of interest, um, but that are not affected by body size. And so this is, I think, um, true that Westaby was correct that we give undue weight to some causal explanations over others if we just always go to these phylogenetic comparative methods. These uh, graphical models also really just clarify the assumptions that we're making about causality when we do something like a PGLS analysis. So I talked about how this was the PGLS model, X causes Y, and then there's residual variation around that uh, that evolves down the phylogeny. But we could have another model where we have X and Y, and through the course of the entire evolutionary history, X has an effect on Y. Um, and this is what's uh, 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 um, uh, represented in the model of slouch that uh, very few people use and should be used lots more than it actually is uh, by Hansen et al. Um, both Felsenstein and Thomas Hansen have, have talked about this for a number of years, and I think it's been very hard for people to understand exactly what the difference is, why you can't do this sort of thing uh, with a PGLS model. And it's really this assumption that, you know, there is history involved in the adaptation or the effect of X on Y uh, through the entire course of evolution of this group. And then I talked about how we have other models, um, taking the page out of Bolu and Amira, that we need to account for. And these are sort of these stuff happens models, that we have these events on the phylogeny that influence the distribution of traits that we see in the present day. And maybe we can get to the point where we really are trying to relate those events to one another, uh, that you know this, uh, this event that's happened across the tree is really uh, related to this other event that's also happening on the tree. And we can start testing those models. What I think is really promising about the graphical modeling approach is that it can tell the, the field of, of causal inference is really uh, about telling us when and where we can distinguish different causal hypotheses. It helps us be explicit about what we're actually doing when we test these. And that thinking about phylogeny as, causal, as basically possible pathways for past causal effects to influence current trait distributions is a better way of thinking about them than that they simply introduce statistical non-independence. <laughs>
we must get better at uh, evaluating these causal hypotheses and, the, and we need to integrate these uh, kind of stuff happens, natural history models where we're accounting for all the just kind of unique things that are happening in, in the history of life. And to expound on this a little bit further, how we could make this, say, a research program and really unlock the potential of comparative methods, what I envision is that we take phylogenetic comparative data, we apply these natural history models where we say stuff happens all across the tree, and these are the clades that where something is really happening differently in these groups. And then we go to the you know nuts, uh, muddy boots biologists who are uh, really studying the mechanisms of evolution within those groups. We understand the processes that make them different from the other groups, and then we build those back into the comparative models. And by doing that, we can form this cycle where we uh, get a better idea of what's driving trade evolution across the entire tree of life. So with that, uh, my co-authors on this paper are Matt Pinnell and Rosanna Zinniel-Ferguson, and, and definitely thank um, Luke Harmon and Thomas Hansen for com conversations over the years, Thomas Hansen especially for um, uh, trying to figure out what he's saying and has, uh, thinks about comparative methods has been really valuable for me to um, uh, come up with uh, these sorts of ideas because um, he's a very, very clear thinker about them, uh, and then other folks um, on these various projects. So hopefully you're still there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're still here. Um, thank you very awesome. much, Joseph. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just to remind people, we can take questions either through Twitter uh, at Pilot Seminar, or you can, um, there's a chat window in the YouTube thing uh, where you can type in a question. So maybe, um, maybe Maybe you can go back to that slide um, that was just before. The, the, your, your sort of sketch of a research program. And can you just say a little bit more? Like, maybe walk us through an example. I mean, you do have the snakes and birds, but um, mm -hmm. like, what's the flavor of the hypothesis that you might be able to, to develop? Right. Oops. Uh, so yeah. So what I so what I'm thinking is exactly like the 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 problem that you know Phrynostoma are a weird clade, right? Uh, with muscle fiber evolution, but we know they're weird for a bunch of other reasons as well. And so you know we've uh, so say we apply the you know like I did in case study two uh, this analysis that says that Phrynostoma have this unexplained shift. They're they're different than other you know, sit and wait or cryptic species. So there's something that needs to be explained there. Well, if you go to somebody like uh, uh, Pianca, who, you know, with this recent paper on the periodic table of niches and lizards, he has, he's uh, obviously an extraordinary natural historian who knows lizards really well and might have some explanations for why Phrynosoma, you know, some models for how Phrynosoma is different. And there are other groups that are kind of like Phrynosoma, like Moloch, the, there's a the spiny lizard in, in, in Australia. And we could include those, that species in the data set, and that's at least then two events. And maybe um, if we start including some of the reasons why we think that, you know, if we do selection studies and we find that, you know, these traits that we're looking at in, in horned lizards are really these are the, the strongest uh, 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 predictors or the strongest drivers of selection in those groups. Maybe we can identify predictors that have greater explanatory power beyond just Phrynosoma, but they really explain um, a lot of these shifts across the tree. And it's really that predictor that we need to build into our comparative model to explain all these shifts. So I think that, that that's why I, I view it as kind of like this, this natural history is pointing us to where uh, the it's like a satellite dish that's telling us where the interesting stuff that we should go study is happening. Uh, we can then go to those biologists who are doing that, or go to the the populations and study them and figure out what are the you know what are the likely causal mechanisms that are really driving evolution of that trait in that group, and then try to think about how those scale up to macroevolutionary scales to build them into our models. And then again, the for like the formalization of that characteristic is that we add some other explanatory variable or it becomes part of our network yeah. or yeah exactly I, I think we want those kind of hypothesis uh, 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 predictor based explanations we don't want the stuff happens explanations but we need to know where the stuff ha that we need to explain <laughs> did happen right so the first step is like plot your data <laughs> uh -huh. know where know where the things uh, that we need to do 
uh, uh, we need that we need to explain are occurring, and then go in, see what's happening, and then that gives us a better idea of the sorts of models that may have even broader, more general explanatory pattern power across the tree of life. Yeah, um, uh, that that makes sense. I mean, I, right? I mean, I, I like the fact that like part of it is sort of like. You're sort of like going back and forth between the maybe more formal statistical side of things and then the, the folks who actually know these species. Mm -hmm. Right. And there may, be ca there may be cases where we can't tell the, the difference. You know, we can't disentangle two alternatives. Uh, I think, you know, the graphical models are really good for that because they, they, can, they can show when these two different, different causal models and the data we have at hand is gonna, can, can be, you know, observationally equivalent and, you know, we might not be able to tell. But I think that's a better situation in being really explicit about that and understanding that than um, uh, just kind of um, uh, going with one or the other or just throwing up our hands, you know. It, it's good to know that we should throw up our hands rather than just <laughs> that, that that's uh, uh, what we want to do. Cool. So Joe Feldenstein says, great talk. I've been uncomfortable for a long time with the statement that people make that phylogenetic inertia is the cause of the patterns that we see. This makes the issues much clearer. Great. I, Thanks, I, actually, Thanks, I don't know, actually know much about the phylogenetic inertia idea, but that's Right, right. So that that that's that's kind of this idea that there's um, uh, so um, it's it's how we talk talk about the the kind of lag. Uh, so Hansen defines phylogenetic inertia as kind of this uh, y doesn't immediately respond to the current value of x. There's this history of this past x that ha has the slowness to it uh, respond, right? So it's gonna you have to account for that entire history. But um, I think a lot of, of folks think that the inertia is maybe um, just well represented by Brownian motion um, occurring, uh, uh, these other factors that are, are slowing down. So I, I think a lot of these things aren't necessarily the well defined often um, in, in, um, uh, uh, in people's minds. It's just that it's so tempting to just use a tool that'll solve the problems when we really need to think about how is, the history of these causal effects uh, down the phylogeny, and how is that affecting the current distribution of traits? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it feels the thing that makes me a little bit hesitant is that, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, what, what do we want from these formal methods? Like, I mean, if we're statisticians, we might want to have like a significance test or something like that, and. It just feels like there's a lot of moving parts here that are difficult to sort of quantify in some formal way. Like, okay, we go talk to the biologists, but like, what is, how does that affect our significance test or something like that? You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I think we want to get at, um, uh, you know, we have ideas that we want to test. We have hypotheses that we want to test that we want to explain the diversity of life. And, and so this is um, a way that acknowledge, to kind of acknowledge that any explanation we have is going to be somewhat limited. Um, and then accounting for that, can we still say something about uh, the effect of this particular uh, hypo predicted uh, mechanism on the evolution of these traits? And I think if we go through this cycle, we can refine that and we can get better and better at it and uh, um, start understanding what's happening here. Um, I, I, I think it's hard. I, it's it's much harder and much more unsatisfying to to you know I've, I've had this kind of crisis because you know people come to me and say, well, what comparative method should I do? And I'm like, I don't know. It, <laughs> it makes it harder, I think. But um, I think we need to get better at it um, well, to avoid these. Sort of like uh, formalizing things in terms of graphical models is definitely a, a solid step forward. Um, and I mean, of course, like Judea Pearl has this whole stuff about you know, actually inferring causality from uh -huh. thing. So, I mean, I do wonder, I mean, maybe, maybe just by, you know, looking lots of species and sort of developing sort of a meta method. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, you know, this, the, these lizards have only evolved once. Uh, and so there's sort of a li limited amount of stuff that we can learn you know, about evolution from that. Uh, like, yeah. I don't mean limited, I mean fixed. Um, right. But I mean, I guess, 
if there's some way that you could sort of develop a method that works between species mm -hmm. and, and sort of apply that larger method again and again and again. Right. I mean, if you find a predictor that, you know, assuming that it's not something that evolved only once and uh, any sort of predictor is going to do better than clade specific shifts, right? Because it can explain lots of variation within those clades potentially. Um, and so uh, the, the, those a priori hypotheses have a lot better explanatory power than just stuff happens hypotheses because they're really constrained to, you know, this clade shifted, this clade shifted, this clade shifted. Whereas a predictor can explain what's happening within clades and across clades potentially. Um, and so it, 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 even if, if something like the exact Phrynosoma uh, horned lizard body plan has evolved only once, which I think we could argue that that's debatable, I think it's evolved more than once. Um, even if it did only evolve once, maybe there's aspects of that that are, you know, there's other species that are maybe kind of going down that road but haven't quite gotten there. We can explain some of that variation across species. So, um, and then maybe sometimes we just can't because it's just a once in a, uh, uh, a 4.5 billion year event or something and we can't, uh, and we can't say anything. Um, and that's fine too. Okay, well, we had a crop of questions here. Um, Stacey Smith says, one concern I have in general is that when we need large numbers of tax and lots of replicated evolutionary events to get robust tests, we increase the chance that there are heterogeneous processes like the relationship between X and Y varies across the states. Do you worry about that? Yeah, and I think that's exactly what these natural history approaches are good for. They're, te they're good at telling us when there are shifts in the process and the tempo and mode of evolution. Um, and that we can can say, okay, we should break the tree in these these points, and then maybe you know estimate the relationship in this part of the tree, and then try to understand what's happening there. Um, and the other other point is is that you know these um, uh, uh, that, that that a single event is evidence of something. You know, I, I, a single coincident event is evidence of uh, a relationship as long as you account for that ascertainment bias. And so, you know, I think really quantifying what evidence that is and what the ascertainment bias that went into it um, can help us to just move forward and say, okay, this is, you know, maybe weak-ish evidence and maybe we can go into developmental biology or uh, which, which Stacy is really uh, good at uh, or something that has another line of evidence that maybe these things are related, you know, having a coincident event with a plausible causal model that makes mechanistic sense is a whole lot better and more convincing to me than having a coincident event that's just middle ear bones and milk that doesn't really seem like it has that direct uh, causal link, right? So. Cool. All right, so Rosanna uh, Zimbel Ferguson has uh, just a comment. Uh, I think the problem is that for a long time we have reduced explanations to hypothesis testing instead of describing complexity. Yeah. Because it works on, uh, highlight the necessity of explaining that complexity. Right. Um, so Joe says it's important to take ascertainment effects into account. I'm glad you pointed to them. Is that a problem? Is, is it a problem that for a group we can go fishing for something that is different about their lifestyle? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you start your study and you're like, well, I want to explain why Phrynosoma have horns and then I'm going to collect, uh, and I think it's because of uh, Phrynosoma are fat, uh, and you collect, you know, data on Phrynosoma and there's only one data, uh, the only them in your data set plus a bunch of lizards that don't have that and the reason that you formulate the hypothesis is because they have it and everything else doesn't then that's a pretty clear case of ascertainment bias. You're just going to get a significant result that's that's not very meaningful. But it's very hard to also, um, uh, you know, have, as soon as you have two events, it becomes much harder to do that sort of thing. Um, and as you add events, I think it becomes way, way harder to uh, have that sort of ascertainment bias. Um, so I think it... It, it, it very quickly becomes a more reasonable problem to deal with, um, and it's harder to have that sort of fishing expedition um, uh, as you move away from that boundary case. But it's definitely something you should worry about when you're near that boundary case. Cool. 
Well, thanks again, Joseph. Uh, it looks like that's the question. So we'll wrap up for today, and hopefully people can make uh, Michael Landis's talk in a month or yeah. so. So um, yeah, thanks for playing that. <laughs> thanks, Eric. Great. Thank you very much. See ya.